Welcome to Black Hair Matters, a Mona Law debate. I'm Dion Jackson Miller, I'm your moderator for this session. Now, Mona Law is known for being on top of controversial, cutting edge legal issues, and more so for incorporating those issues into teaching moments for our students. So it's natural that the current controversy about black hair and our constitution would make its way very quickly into a Mona Law activity. Now, you're going to be hearing from students at various levels of the faculty during the debate, Afterwards, um, we'll have the judging that will be done by Mona Law tutor Jeffrey Foreman, as well as Mona Law lecturer Gabriel Elliott Williams. After that, we're going to have a post-debate discussion with attorney Clyde Williams and public commentator and social justice advocate Carol Narcisse. Before all of that, though, let's go to Mona Law's Tracy Robinson to kick us off. Family members, all of you who are joining, students in the Faculty of Law, welcome to you all. Uh, this is the fourth Mona Law public law debate, as Dion mentioned, and it revolves around the motion which you see on the screen. Police grooming codes that prohibit the wearing of locks are demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. I'm Tracy Robinson. I'm first and foremost, in this context, one of the public law teachers and also I'm a deputy dean with responsibility for graduate studies and research. Um, we're happy you're joining us and we're especially happy to be part of the orientation of first year students to the Faculty of Law. This debate is a collaboration between teachers, two of whom you have already met in Ms. Jackson Miller and myself, and more you'll meet as judges, as coaches, and so on, so it's a, it's a collaboration between us and students and particularly uh, the Mona Law Society, which is led by Janelle Small, who is also the debate master this year. There are approximately, even though you see eight on your screen, 30 students at the undergraduate level who are involved in this debate. And they include students who are graduating in 2020. I just wanted to say a little bit about who is before you, including those eight students. You're seeing the names of a range of students who serve today as backbenchers. Uh, so they have served as the researchers for the two teams and the four persons who will be presenting. And their coaches are Anika Gray and Glenn Roy Murray, lecturer and tutor in the Faculty of Law. And you'll come to see very quickly, as Ms. Jackson Miller mentioned, the, the debate judges who, and those who actually have led this process uh, during the late summer. Gabriel Elliott Williams, a lecturer in the Faculty of Law and Public Law, a member of the winning team at the Global Human Rights Moot in South Africa many years ago, and Jeffrey Foreman, a public law tutor in the Faculty Crown Council, a uh, Shevening scholar with considerable debating and mooting experience. And there are judges today. Tutor Dion Jackson Miller is here. Ramona Biholar, who you don't see on screen, an international human rights uh, teacher in the faculty, has been part of the teaching team in preparation for today. So to come back to the topic, which is very much part of the Caribbean conversation, not just in Jamaica, but around the Caribbean, which is the extent to which regulation of hairstyles, particularly the wearing of locks in schools, the police and places of employment, raise questions of human rights. Uh, the debaters will talk about freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, the right to equitable and humane treatment by a public authority, the protection against racial discrimination. And if they think rights are implicated, they'll ask themselves the question, can you justify limiting the right through hair regulation? Notice when we, that we ask Black Hair Matters, we are asking in two different ways. We're asking and signaling that we're concerned with issues of black hair in the known. But we're also asking the word, does black hair matter in the Caribbean today? Are issues of race and racial discrimination pertinent ones to talk about in the context of the Caribbean? I want to publicly thank the Association of Caribbean Commissioners of Police 
who very generously shared their quotes across the Caribbean uh, to assist us in our own research. And this Mutan signals the support across the region for having meaningful conversations about these issues. Let me end by saying that the debate reflects the university's aspiration to be accessible to everyone. And hence, we have turned our classrooms inside out, our classrooms in constitutional law, Commonwealth Caribbean human rights law, international human rights law, supervised independence research papers. All those students are before you today debating and arguing in a public space about the content of teaching at Mona Law. The goal of the University of the West Indies is also to be aligned to the region's needs. And this debate signals Mona, Mona Law's interest in not just being a rigorous space of learning, but a relevant one, one relevant to the needs of the region. In this context, I want to particularly thank attorney Clyde Williams and civil society advocate Karen Narcisse who are joining us in the commentary section as we attempt to be part of national regional conversations. And then I would say to our new students or prospective students, that look on the extracurricular work and curricular work being done at Mona Law by both students and teachers, particularly the leaders of this process, Gabriel Elliott Williams and Jeffrey Foreman, but I'd add to that Administrator Andrew Hutchinson, Mona Media. All of this speaks to a University of the West Indies that is interested in ensuring its agility, that its staff is caring, accountable, creative, and motivated. And finally, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the Faculty of Law. And we are part of an important tradition. The first graduates of the Faculty of Law who started in 1970 included President of the Court of Appeal, Dennis Morrison. The second class included President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Adrian Saunders, preeminent litigator, Michael Hilton, outstanding educator, Dorcas White. In this debate, I also call up the memories of our forebears in the Faculty of Law in public law and the public law tradition. And these include Professor Ralph Carnegie, Professor Simeon McIntosh, Professor Margaret DeMaria, Professor Albert Fiaggio, Dr. Francis Alexis from Grenada, Dr. Kenny Anthony, former Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Sir Hugh Rollins, former Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, and especially from the bar, former lecturer at St. Augustine, Douglas Mendez. These students today debating, but also us as academics, sit in their legacy. And we hopefully will build on it, including ensuring that there are many more women in this list in a few years. Over to you, moderator, Dion Jackson Miller. Good luck to all. Thank you so very much. And that should give you a very good idea of the reason that, that we all are so very proud to be part of this legal tradition in the Caribbean and more particularly the Mona Law tradition. We have research from the faculty that is showing up um, through articles, through books, through important court rulings in the region. And one of the interesting things about Mona Law is how much interesting research there is in fact that has come out of undergrads as well as postgrads. So let me bring in Dwayne Hilton, Joanne Hilton, I beg your pardon, and ask him to tell you a little bit about the work he has done. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joanne Hilton, and I recently completed my Bachelor of Laws at Mona Law. During my final semester, I undertook supervised independent research on appearance and grooming regulations in eight Anglophone Caribbean police forces. I discovered that these forces maintained grooming policies which regulated hair, height, and weight. Regarding hair, all countries contain a general prohibition against wearing long hair. In some police forces, popular Afrocentric hairstyles such as dreadlocks, locks, braids, and cornrows are banned. Furthermore, Two states imposed weight requirements on its members, and three territories contain minimum height requirements. The reasons given for these regulations included the need for uniformity of appearance and to ensure the safety of its members while on duty. As such, I sought to determine whether these codes breached Bill of Rights provisions, particularly equality and non-discrimination rights, freedom of expression, and freedom of conscience. 
Additionally, I consider the relevance of human dignity as an underlying feature of each right. And lastly, I took the view that several of these grooming regulations were unconstitutional. Since these grooming codes and appearance restrictions have varying impacts on human rights, I'm very eager to see how our brilliant debaters will tackle these issues. I hope at the end of this debate, we all gain further appreciation of the protection offered by our Bill of Rights provisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jubin. You know, I always felt there was something wrong with me as five foot one not being allowed to join the police, you know. So, <laughs> so we look forward, as you said, to what is going to come from the debaters. I'm going to introduce um, debate master Janelle Small now, and from there, the debate is just going to flow. You won't see me again until the end. So sit back and enjoy, everybody. Moderator, judges, coaches, debate facilitators, our team members, and also our technical staff. And of course, our audience today, good morning. My name is Janelle Small, the Mona Law Society president and also the Guild Faculty of Law representative. Today, I act in the capacity as debate master, the liaison between the debate facilitators and the teams to ensure that the process of preparations go smoothly and also that our team members remain encouraged. So my task today is to introduce the debate motion, the teams, and also the rules governing today's debate. And so the fourth Mona Law public law debate involving the Mona Law students and teachers considers the motion. Be it resolved, police grooming codes that prohibit the wearing of locks are demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. There are three sub-motions that will be debated by each team, the first submotion is the rights to freedom of expression and freedom of conscience do not include hairstyles without more. The second submotion is the prohibition on locks in police grooming codes does not violate the rights to equitable and humane treatment and to freedom from discrimination. Okay, Janelle, I think Janelle may have popped out for a moment. One of the, one of those, <laughs> one of those things we've all become used to in the Zoom era of meetings and debates. So let's see if we can get her back on. Um, and in the meantime, let me just, I'm just waiting just a moment or two because I really would like to see her finish the, the introduction um, so let's just hold on a moment. And we have people, of course, watching. We have our students watching. We've been sharing as well with the wider community. And as well, I know we're streaming. We're, we're going to be on YouTube. But I think one of the... Have you rejoined us, Janelle? Yes, I have. Great. So awesome. let's, great. Let me continue. And the third submotion is, insofar as any rights are limited, the limitation is justifiable. So the motions today are based on a hypothetical situation, but the students have been asked to consider it in the light of the Constitution of Jamaica and its Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. The teams today comprise Mona Law students, including students graduating in 2020. Each team is comprised of the front bench, or speakers, and the back bench, or researchers. So whilst we will be hearing from our speakers today as they enunciate their points with clarity and precision, the researchers are very crucial to the process in creation of the speeches and researching the cases and information needed for the speakers to be knowledgeable of the topic today. So on side government on the front bench, we have Ronaldo Richards, um, a second year student currently as prime minister, the Deputy Prime Minister being Candy Chin, a graduating student this year. Kweku Cummings as government member, a, sec a third year student, pardon me. And Ruth Ann Roberts as the government whip, also a third year student. On the back bench, we have Mr. Joshua Page, Iqbal Chevaria, Sashana Butler, Gabrielle Chin, Kimani Douglas, Catherine Smith, Sharla Susie, and Rashawn Robinson. And their coach that assisted in the preparation of the debate is Glenroy Murray, a tutor at the Mona Law. 
opposite on the opposition side we have O'Neill Cornelly as a leader of the opposition, a second year student going into third year. The deputy leader of the opposition is Shannon Young, a third year student this year. On the opposition member, we have Alia Myri, a second year student, and also for um, the opposition whip, we have Tamoy Campbell, a second year student as well. On the back bench, we have Shamar Wedderburn, Jamai Charles, Kimari Young, Jafar Thompson, Stephen Harvey, Afrika Stevens, Chanel Nelson, Brian Dehaney, and Sashara Eccleston. Their coach that assisted in preparation is Anika Gray, a lecturer at Mona Law. The rules of the debate are as follows. The first two speakers on each team have each been allocated seven minutes, including responding to questions from the judges. The last two speakers are allocated five minutes each, including responding to questions from the judges. The judges will have the discretion to give extensions pardon me, on the time. Teams will also be indicated by the debate master, myself, by show of an index card when they have three minutes remaining, one minute remaining, and finally, when their time has expired. If speakers persist, then they will be stopped by the moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, the team members have worked extremely hard to bring themselves to this moment, and I know today will be riveting and we will learn a lot. Thank you once more for joining, and I wish all the best to the team. Thank you. Order, order. The fourth Mona Law public debate has commenced. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, please address us. Panel of adjudicators, colleague government members, members of the opposition, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, good day. Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights Handbook actually declares that belief is not the same as opinion. As for a belief to rise to the level of opinion, the belief must attain a certain level of seriousness and be compatible with respect for human dignity. In that context, the government rises to table the motion. Police dress and grooming codes, which prohibits the wearing of locks are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. As the Prime Minister, my presentation will focus on the submotion. The rights to freedom of expression and freedom of conscience do not include hairstyles without more. The Deputy Prime Minister will demonstrate that the prohibition of locks in the police force is not tantamount to race discrimination. The government member will enunciate the need and extent to which limitations on certain rights can take place in our society and the government whip will in clear terms illustrate why the government's arguments are the stronger of the two. Sections 13, 3C, and 12, 1 and 2 of the Jamaican and Antiguan constitutions, respectively, establishes the right to freedom of expression. This is further supported by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also establishes the scope for the right. The second important concept is that of freedom of conscience, which is contained within Section 133B of Jamaica's Constitution. Dr. Lloyd Barnett, in his seminal text, The Constitutional Law of Jamaica, noted in part that the enjoyment, and I'm quoting, the enjoyment of the right of freedom of conscience involves the right to carry out the external practices of one's creed and to endeavor to pers persuade others to adopt one's belief. Madam Speaker, it should be noted that the Jamaican and Antiguan constitutions were referenced as they're identical to the constitutional framework of Trinidadus. My presentation will focus on two points. The realization that freedom of conscience is more than just thoughts, but actions must also be taken, and the imprecise standard to be used to determine what is considered freedom of expression. Rob Madam Speaker, Rob Vischer captures the essence of freedom of conscience perfectly when he said that the notion that the dictates of conscience are defined, articulated, and lived out in relationship with others, that is, while the core of conscience is inward looking, the relational aspect of conscience is necessarily broader. This means that the freedom of conscience, while understood to be the ability of the individual to have thoughts and make decisions without the influence of the state or another person, it's more than just thoughts, but it must also include actions. Simply put, if it is not communicated, 
it cannot be protected. In the case of Miss Brown, there's no evidence that she communicated the reason for her hairstyle to the police authorities. In essence, using the words of the learned judge in Dale Virgo and the Board of Management of Kensington Primary School and others, if you don't make your conscience known, you cannot claim a right arising from it. Madam Mr. Speaker, Richard, Mr. Richards, question for you. Would you accept that um, in a context where um, locks are frowned upon, frowned upon, where um, there is routinely discrimination in relation to locks, that the wearing of locks could in fact communicate something? I do take the point, but in a context where, where it is necessary to demonstrate your conscience being linked to an external action, it's not sufficient to say that the mere wearing of your locks is tantamount to you speaking of against discrimination. And that is a point that would be further addressed by the Deputy Prime Minister in her presentation. Madam Speaker, this is precisely the more that we on the government benches are adamant that is necessary to ensure that the freedom of conscience protects those who are wearing or advocating for a specific thing. In fact, in the case law, freedom of conscience is often linked with political freedom, religious rights, and social advocacy. This linkage is not coincidental or sophist, but it is done as the truest metric for understanding whether a person is asserting their freedom of conscience is through practical and obvious situations. This argument finds strength in the Caribbean cases of the Freitas and Permanent Secretary, Mohammed and Marine and Tomlinson and TVG and others. These are cases where the freedom has been linked to tangible actions and communicated to other parties. Therefore, Madam Speaker, it would be inconceivable for any government to sanction the possibility of all hairstyles without the intent to be communicated on the freedom of conscience without out more. As so what, this Mr. Is Prime not, Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, what about expression? Uh, why, why, why do you say expression does not include uh, the wearing of dreadlocks in a society such as um, Trin, the, the society we're dealing with here? Because when one considers what expression is, we're not saying that to wear a uh, hairstyle or have hairstyle implicit as not expression. What we're saying is that it's not protected by freedom of conscience without more. And yes, that and I'm, more and I'm has to be. The, I'm asking you about expression. So is it, that you're, is it that you're conceding that the, the wearing of locks um, would be protected under the banner of freedom of expression? Absolutely not. The, the point is, when you wear hairstyles, hairstyles alone, without being linked to some other uh, form or period of expression, uh, cannot be viewed as being protected by the freedom of expression. When you consider the hierarchy of scenarios that ought to be protected by freedom of expression, and when you balance that with the proportionality of uh, the safety of the police officer within the, air, the, the police force, where the police authorities themselves have noted that the wearing of locks uh, places police officers at a direct risk of being disarmed more easily. And if a situation like that warrants the ability of the government to limit... But the that, right Mr. Prime Minister, that's not, um, we're not at that stage of, of this debate. What we want to understand is whether or not expression, um, hairstyles and dreadlocks in particular, can fall within the, the remit of, of expression. And isn't uh, dreadlocks a, a, a political uh, a, a statement that, that someone um, has or some, some other means of um, communicating to others in a society such, such as ours, a particular belief about that, that, that person? And, and if, if that's the case, why, why shouldn't expression uh, cover, cover here to, to add to my, my brother judge's um, question, um, given the, the sort of history um, associated with um, dreadlocks, um, the sort of oppression that persons who wear the hairstyle um, have faced. Uh, isn't the wearing of dreadlocks a political statement? And the answer to your question is no. Uh, wearing dreadlocks in our society, even if you were supposed to concede that it might be a political statement, without more... But, uh, uh, finish that hello, sentence hello. for me, and then, and then we have to... We have to I'm, I'm getting this, the time signal from the debate master. 
part without more that it does not properly reach the threshold of what is supposed to be considered freedom of expression. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Leader of the, the opposition, um, what do you have to say in response? A person's choice of attire is inextricably bound with the expression of his or her gender identity, autonomy, and individual liberty. How individuals choose to dress and present themselves is integral to their right to freedom of expression. This choice is an expressive statement protected under the right to freedom of expression. Adjudicators, my worthy opponents, fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I cite the Honorable Mr. Justice Sykes to say, we the opposition whole, wholeheartedly disagree with the notion proposed by the government before this honorable house that police dress and grooming codes which prohibit the wearing of locks are demonstratively justified in a free and democratic society. Now, before I start, the prime minister said that hairstyles do not need to be linked to some other form of expression. But we, the opposition, will illustrate why hairstyles can stand on its own as being encompassed under the right to freedom of expression and that of conscience, which are points my argument will surround. While the rights to, to equitable and humane treatment and to, and to freedom, of this, freedom from discrimination, rather, on the basis of race, will be elaborated by my deputy, with my opposition member ultimately critiquing the standard that is demonstratively justified. The opposition is adamant that a combination of the Sioux generous or generous approach to constitutional interpretation, the living instrument approach, and the approach of seeking clarity from international law and international jurisprudence must be followed in cases such as this. The generous approach calls for right-giving provisions to be interpreted generously as a generous approach gives full recognition and effect to the fundamental rights and freedoms. Given uh, Mr. The Mr. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, um, take it as a given that we accept that um, the provisions must be interpreted generously. Right. Um, right. Yeah, so you could proceed from there. All right. With the case between Robinson and the Attorney General in mind, in order to deduce if the applicant's rights have been breached, it ought to be examined the nature, content, and meaning of the right which has been said to be infringed. That is, whether Ms. Brown's right to freedom of expression and to conscience have been infringed by virtue of the police force prohibiting her dreadlock hairstyle. With regard to how these rights to be, are to be interpreted, our central argument is this. The right to freedom of expression and to freedom of conscience should be construed to include hairstyles that have expressive content and showcase or are integral to the individual's belief system. In Irving Toy, the Canadian Supreme Court, in defining the meaning of expression in Section 2B of the Charter, held that expression has both content and a form, and the two can be inextricably connected. Activities expressive if it attempts to convey a message, that, me that meaning is its content. Further, the court held that we cannot exclude human activity from the scope of guaranteed free expression on the basis of the content or meaning being conveyed. Indeed, it is the activity convey, if the activity conveys or attempts to convey a meaning, it has expressive content and prima facie falls within the scope of the guarantee. But Mr. Leader of the Opposition, isn't that precisely the point that the, the Prime Minister was making? The Prime Minister asserts that uh, with freedom of expression, there must have been the intention to communicate something. And he's saying that um, the wearing of locks without more communicates nothing. Right. But he fails to, sh he fails to identify that dreadlocks, that freedom of expression does not, hold, does not include dreadlocks at all. But we're here to show that it does because it's not necessarily limited to speech, but it expresses a person's thoughts and ideas. Continue. Right? You have three minutes. 
But he, the Prime Minister also says that if, if she, he basically said that she, if she cannot make her conscience known, but she has made her conscience known. He also says that belief desires a certain level of seriousness. So is he saying that her philosophical belief that her hairstyle represents and celebrates her blackness and beauty isn't serious enough? That forms an important part of how she identifies herself. What the government wishes to do is to paint a picture, an image that finds herself insignificant and not capable of being found as included within her fundamental rights and freedoms. But what the government has done is to construe a meaning that undermines the value of these rights. And there I say the complete essence and underlying spirit of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, and by extension, the wholehearted supremacy of the Constitution. We refuse to accept that the right to freedom of expression and that of conscience are to be construed narrowly if we consider the authorities laid out and those yet to come. I urge this honorable house to interpret the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms with the legal submissions of the opposition at the forefront. Thank you. Okay, excellent uh, timing there, uh, Mr. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, we now move to the second uh, sub-motion uh, dealing with the rights to equitable and humane treatment and the freedom from discrimination on the basis of race. Um, uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister, please address us. Distinguished judges and colleagues, all protocols observed. As said by the Prime Minister, I will show that the rights to equitable and humane treatment and to freedom from discrimination on the basis of race are not violated by the TPF grooming codes. If I may begin, concerning the right to equitable and humane treatment found in Section 5 of the Trinidadus Constitution, there is not much given in order to understand the weight of this right. In conceptualizing this right, I find it necessary to agree with the statements of the Joint Select Committee, which recognizes that equitable does not mean equal. Therefore, in determining what is equitable treatment will necessarily be circumstantial. To illustrate, in the case of Wade and Rochez, it was unfair to treat women, women and men having children out of wedlock the same given their inherent biological differences. In Mrs. Brown's current circumstances, this government believes that the grooming policy has been fairly applied as it takes into account the different races and cultures present in our society and in acknowledging these differences places the regulation on all officers in a, for a particular purpose which my government member will expound upon. To conceptualize what humane treatment is, let me direct you to what it is not. International jurisprudence has recognized that a wide spectrum of treatment can amount to inhumane treatment based on varying degrees of severity. Humane treatment and dignity is at the basis of all human rights. I must ask you then, does the banning of locks for a legitimate purpose look like holding one down and cutting their hair or preventing one from eating for days? No, it does but not. Madam, ma ma Madam Deputy Prime Minister, isn't the uh, dignity aspect uh, critical to understanding what is, is happening here? Um, in a society such as the one we're dealing with, um, why shouldn't someone who comes from an uh, African background has hair that grows in a particular way uh, be, uh, be excluded from the protection of, of equitable treatment? Does it not undermine their dignity to say to them that your uh, particular um, hairstyle um, is not worthy of being um, acknowledged and accepted in, in the security forces? I don't believe that the policy speaks anything to a person's worth. However, my learned colleague will further discuss the legitimate purpose for why this grooming code is in place. Continue. Although the government believes that locks may not be wearable as a police officer, the inherent dignity and humanity of such noble characters is still upheld given the certain circumstances in which they operate, as my government member will expound upon. Before speaking to racial discrimination, this government will aim to define the concepts of discrimination and race. It must be noted that discrimination within the Trinidadus Constitution, much like the Jamaican Constitution, is not defined. As such, the contemporary definition adopted throughout the Commonwealth Caribbean for discrimination will be put forward. Therefore, discrimination is defined as differential treatment afforded to one person on certain grounds, such as race, which exposes this person to being disadvantaged or deprived of privileges, which another is entitled to enjoy. 
This definition was found in Section 14 of the Antigua and Barbuda Constitution and is further supported in the case of A.G. and Jones, which clearly puts forward that in order to satisfy a claim of discrimination, the claimant must show less advantageous treatment on any of the listed grounds in order in relation to a similarly situated individual. Um, um, Madam Deputy Prime Minister, uh, the Trinidadus Constitution um, speaks to rights as having an inherent nature, as being premised on the inherent dignity um, of individuals. Uh, doesn't so the sort of approach that you are commending to us um, doesn't that undermine notions of dignity and inherency? No, it does not. Seeing as we live in a multiracial and multicultural society, how the policy has been applied um, takes into account the differences that will be seen in such a comparator. If I may continue. Additionally, race in itself is an elusive concept. There is a constant battle as to what should be included within its boundaries. This government would like to put forward that race must be determined based on immutable characteristics and certain other, other mutable characteristics which are genuinely held as being an expression of one's lineal race. The view has, this view has gained considerable traction in jurisdictions such as the US and the UK, as espoused by Jacqueline Frank in her 2011 piece, The 11th Circuit Grad Blocks Ban. The argument that the TPF grooming code violates the right to freedom of, from racial discrimination is flawed for the following reasons. Whilst locks and the wearing of braids has been continuously linked to the black race and more so Rastafarianism, according to writer Bert Asher in his work, Twisted, My Dreadlock Chronicles, the first evidence of dreadlocks were actually of Indian origin and not of the black race. The opposition, however, will strive incredulously to paint this picture differently. However, even if you were to prefer the view put forward by the opposition, the case of Rogers and AM Airlines may persuade you otherwise. As the court held, if a particular hairstyle or trait has been culturally appropriated by members of a different race, this hairstyle or trait no longer belongs exclusively to the race who originated it or has used it as a means of self-identification for centuries. Presently, this would mean that with the high levels of interracial amity, dreadlocks and braids are now being frequently done by persons of varying races and cultural backgrounds, as well as throughout the fashion industry. So Madam, Madam, Madam Deputy Prime Minister, are you saying that um, the, the racial connection uh, loses value so long as um, other persons of other races and ethnicities uh, take it over? It's, it's, it's no longer meaning to the individual anymore? You, you have a minute. No. Doesn't, doesn't, it, doesn't it matter um, if, if a particular racial group um, continues to strongly identify with it uh, and um, significantly as well, that others identify that particular hairstyle um, with that uh, racial group. Absolutely. However, in determining whether the trait or um, hairstyle has been appropriated is determined based on the extent and duration of the use by the other race. Okay. Thank you uh, very much for your time. I believe is now as now at an at an end. Uh, we now go to the deputy. Uh, yes, that's that. We now move to the deputy uh, leader of the opposition. I may have I, I may have given you a second less than you needed, but your your responses were concise, and we thank you for for that. Uh, we now move to the deputy leader of the opposition to respond uh, to this aspect of the submotion, uh, Madam Deputy. Good morning. All protocols observed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the prohibition on locks in police grooming codes does violate the right to equitable uh, humane treatment and to freedom from discrimination on the basis of race. The, opposite, the Deputy Prime Minister was just very much forced to recognize that a grouping that may be iconically associated with a particular trait and hairstyle will more than likely be considered to belong to them. And therefore, the argument that it was originally from the Indians is null and void. I continue. I will first contend with the right to equitable and humane treatment by any public authority in the exercise of any function to which the words equitable and humane are key. Many persons and cases often equate the words 
equity with equality, but as the Deputy Prime Minister so rightly pointed out, they are not synonymous. And as she also rightly pointed out, the Joint Select Committee insists on fairness and dignity as the standard for this right. And these must be acknowledged. I fail to see how in this situation, the police grooming codes in question, banning braids and locks, and punishing those who wear their hairstyle in this way could ever be in line with this right, especially with the standard of fairness. There is no indication that her I'm, hair... I'm, I'm sorry, um, Madam um, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Um, wouldn't you accept that the very idea of discrimination suggests that um, somebody is being treated less than somebody else? Um, so isn't, isn't the, um, the Deputy Prime Minister correct in asserting that what we ought to be looking for is a comparator? Not necessarily. The standard as brought about by cases like she mentioned, such as Wade and Rochelle's, actually insists on there being a, a, a marked disadvantage to the persons impacted by such a code. And the Canadian courts also insist that these codes must not perpetuate the historical prejudices that often are found rooted in Caribbean societies. Continuing, there is no indication that her hair was unkempt or that it ever affected her ability to perform her duties well. Miss Brown had her locks when she was being considered for the force, yet she was still engaged. If the ban on braids and locks was truly justifiable, why was she hired in the first place? Side government, please indicate what about these two specific black natural hairstyles could be grounds for fair dismissal. The word humane, which the Deputy Prime Minister desperately tried to ignore in the right, is defined by Duhame's Law Dictionary as human dignity being an individual or group's sense of self-respect, self-worth, physical and, in and psychological integrity and empowerment. I draw your attention to Section uh, Madam, 13. Madam Deputy, um, if it was known, if the policy of the force was known prior to um, the, the, ad, the admission of the individual. Um, how could it be unfair, unfair to her? Uh, she knew what the rules were, um, and uh, she was always exposed to the possibility that the force would uh, decide to, to enforce the rules um, against her. So what, 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 what is so... Correct, to, to some extent. But nevertheless, it is the police force's rules, and if they don't see any valid reason to uphold it, why should she worry? Continuing, I draw your attention to 13.1 of Jamaica's constitution. All persons in Jamaica are entitled to preserve for themselves and future generations the fundamental rights and freedoms to which they are entitled by virtue of their dignity as persons and citizens of a free and democratic society. Ava Brown's hair is tied to this. She's proud of it. It is a statement of her blackness, as she so admits. It makes her feel beautiful. She's had them all her life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is all she knows. But, um, so therefore, Ma how Madam Deputy Leader of, of the Opposition, if we are to find that um, there has been discrimination on the basis of race, shouldn't we uh, do as um, the Deputy Prime Minister suggested, which is to, to find racial discrimination um, uh, if there has been discrimination on the basis of an immutable characteristic? Um, you know, locks can come and go, can't they? And I'm sure the government would love for us to rely on such a standard as it was done in the case of EEOC and catastrophe management solutions. However, Ms. Green, in her article, Splitting Hairs, rightly criticizes the American courts for using this outdated doctrine to insist that cultural elements such as black natural hair size cannot tr trigger potential protection from anti-discrimination laws. Quite frankly, the government has employed a very narrow definition of race. Contrary to common belief, race is not limited 
to physical or quote-unquote unchangeable features. In fact, the features such as hair, as Ms. Green also states, data from an actual study to note is not so changeable at all. In fact, she points out that to change hairstyles such as braids or locks, especially being so deeply ingrained in the culture of those of African descent, is quite hard. She points out that they spend inordinately more to change these hairstyles or maintain others. Okay. Thank you. you. You have less than a minute, so if you could just give us uh, your last point, we'd be grateful. This, this police code is, while it may not seem to be overtly discriminatory, as was pointed out and held in the case of Griggs and Duke, it is very subtly and indirectly discriminatory. As pointed out by me earlier, the hairstyles are deeply ingrained in the culture of those of African descent. So who do you think are more likely to be sporting them? Obviously, black persons. And therefore, it indirectly excludes these persons from participating or serving on the force. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget that here, standing before you, being black, dark-skinned, and speaking as I do with my Afro, I am my ancestor's wildest dreams. And as Eva Brown serves and protects her country in locks, so is she. I thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you very much, you, uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, we now move to the, the, the third and, and final substantive submotion. Uh, insofar as any rights are limited, uh, the limitation is justifiable. So we're now assuming that the first uh, two moots uh, establish that the, the right uh, covers the, the facts of the, the case. Uh, we begin with the government uh, member to address us on this motion. Uh, Mr. Member, please go ahead. Adopting the protocols established, good morning. The deputy leader of the opposition has tried to spew the narrative that the hearsays in question are, or sorry, that the TPF regulation is, unjust, is not justified, but this government wholeheartedly disagrees. The Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister have clearly shown that the rights and freedoms in question have not been infringed as, the, as a result of the TPF Dress and Grooming Code. However, even if these rights and freedoms were truly limited, such limitation is undoubtedly demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society in accordance with Section 2 of the Trinibator's Constitution. Chief Justice Dixon in the Canadian Oaks case expressed that rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Charter are not, however, absolute, but their limitation may be necessary where their exercise would be inimical to the realization of collective goals of fundamental importance. Further, in the phrase Chief Justice Floizak in the Court of Appeal noted that servants of the state are in a unique position which requires them to submit to a level of restraint, especially where it is reasonably required for the proper performance of their functions. Following this line of argument, police officers would be subject to a level of restraint beyond that of the normal civil servant due to their fundamental importance to the proper function of society. A similar argument was successfully made in Kelly and Johnson, where the U.S. Supreme Court noted that cases such as these, these fall within a certain class in which the state has an interest in regulating an individual's personal appearance. To determine whether constitutionally guaranteed rights and freedoms have been legitimately limited, the proper approach is that of the Oaks test, which has been concisely restated and applied in Robinson and the AG, the Nitz case, by Chief Justice Sykes. The first element of the four-pronged test is that there must be a sufficiently important objective which warrants the limitation in question. It must be reasonably required. The necessity for the TPS dress and grooming code goes far beyond mere aesthetics. The very nature of police officers' job exposes them to all manner of danger, and it is necessary, and with such an essential responsibility to the safety of this country, it is necessary that officers be in an optimal position to properly perform their duties. So, Therefore, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but why precisely do locks present a danger? Um, so the thing is that um, locks and braids, hairstyles such as these, increase the risk posed to officers as assailants could simply take hold of an officer's hair, and this could result in them being disarmed, or it could also result in injury or death, and it can also result, um, it also prevents the proper wear of um, authorized police headgear. But couldn't and this. None I'm sorry, but couldn't non-locked long hair uh, pose a similar danger? It is, um, well, the, the, there is a suggestion that um, office, I mean, uh, prohibition on long hair might be more appropriate. However, that raises an uh, issue of enforcement and the practicality 
However, that would be too ridiculous and too time consuming for the persons who should be on our streets enforcing the laws, protecting our people and property and this country. And that covers the second element of the Oaks test, which is that there must be a rational connection between the important objective, objective implemented and the, sorry, between the important objective and the measures implemented. The third element of the Oaks test is that the measure must be proportional to the objective and that it limits the right, in, it so bears the right no more. Mr. Government Member, on, on that previous point, uh, the, the policy appears to be a blanket one. So um, all members of the force are subjected to the, uh, to the same rule. Um, is it the case that um, all aspects of the police force operations uh, pose the same uh, risk that you are um, causing us, are asking us to, to accept, uh, such that there can't be any uh, exceptions at all to it? So would you be willing to concede that um, some persons who, let's say, have desk duties only, um, that those persons shouldn't be prohibited from wearing locks? The government, the, the TPF's um, code is aimed more so at the officers who are in the field. So I can accept that officers are, are members of the force on desk duty would um, not be subject to this um, code. Uh, the question... A, so could you just give us a sense of your, your overall argument regarding the balance between uh, the measure and the limitation? The prohibition on, dr on dreadlocks and braids is not an extreme one. Um, uh, it is not an extreme one, and this is definitely demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. When you look at the final step of the Oaks test, it requires a balancing exercise, weighing the effects of the measures against the purpose or the benefit to be served. The dress codes in question does not take away from the black experience or from black culture, as there are other hairstyles of um, black hairstyles that can be worn by members of the force. And in fact, any infraction on the freedom of expression, conscience, religion, or any right for that matter would be minor and trumped by the benefit to be had by operational efficiency in the TPF. I thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Government uh, Member. Uh, we now move to the opposition member to uh, tell us why uh, the measures can't be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Please, Good morning, please. everyone. My leader of opposition and his deputy have proposed cogent arguments which demonstrate that the impugned provision of the dress and grooming code enforced by the TPF is in, is undeniably inimical to several fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed on, under the Trinidadus Constitution. Contrary to the misguidance of the government, I stand here to categorically prove to this honorable house that the restrictive hairstyle measures enumerated in the said, in the said section are not demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society and as such contravenes section two of the Trinidadus Constitution. The standard, this standard for assessing limitations is identical to that of section 13, subsection two of the Jamaican constitution. Thus, the Jamaican case of Robinson and attorney general in which the Oaks test was applied provides guidance. Madam Speaker, it is evident that the restrictive measures in this scenario fail all four criteria of the Oaks test. It is my purpose to illustrate that one, their objectives are not so important to warrant violation of Ava's fundamental rights and freedoms. Two, they're not rationally connected to their objectives. Three, the restrictions tremendously impair the rights and freedoms. And four, the benefits that the restrictions are touted to have pale in comparison to the profound harm that it causes to Ava. Chief Justice Sykes posits that the proper purpose component of the Oaks test is satisfied when the objective of the restrictions is so important, when the objectives of the restrictions are so important that it became, that it becomes... Uh, I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, is it your suggestion that mm -hmm. uh, the goals of um, uniformity in the force with the knock-on benefits that you you could anticipate coming from that, um, the, the safety considerations that those aren't sufficiently important objectives? Absolutely not. I do concede that those objectives are definitely 
important. However, I believe that Justice Sykes and Chief Justice Dixon in Oaks were deliberate in including the criterion that they must have become necessary to violate the right. So it is clear that uniformity and the safety of police op officers are important objectives, but I submit that the, important of the importance of the objectives ought to be considered in conjunction with the resultant necessity of violating the right. And based on this literal interpretation, I posit that the measures themselves and the resultant impingement on Ms. Brown's rights were simply not necessary. Its unwarranted nature is further proved in that the policy prescribes only two hairstyles, while there remains a myriad of other hairstyles of diverse colors and lengths that have been left unregulated. And as such, the policy is patently incapable of achieving uniformity in hair appearance. Moreover, it is long hair and not locked or braided hair that would predispose officers to disarmament, because indeed, cascading hair of any style could be easily grabbed by aggressors. This policy is pertinent to the manner of styling and not length. Therefore, it does not actually, dis it does not actually mitigate disarmament as it purports to do. Because in fact, locks can be worn in, in a short style or can be wrapped or pinned up. Thus, but, uh, Madam um, opposition member, uh, what if it's the case that in this particular society, uh, the vast majority of people who wear so-called long hair are people who uh, wear locks? So that in, in, in fact, what the uh, police force is doing is tailoring the, this, the, the rule um, to the particular features of this society. You, you have a minute left. It still remains a broad, a broad brush and, and wide scale, um, wide scale measure that's based on a based on an assumption. Even though it could be guided by the by the, the norms of that society, I still believe that for the purposes of of rationality, for the purposes of of um, to to rid the, the provision of its patent its patent arbitrariness, that it should list the length as a factor. Continuing, the, the Oaks test also stipulates that the restrictions must minimally impair the right. In failing to, to include nuances pertaining to length, this provision remain, is excessive and thus violates this element. And finally, the fourth prong, which necessitates that the benefits of the right must outweigh the harm, is, is also not satisfied as the harm done to Ava's personhood, dignity, and livelihood far supersede any supposed benefit that the, that the state uh, would, would gain. Additionally, I would, I would like to include Mr. Paul Secunda's view, or as Mr. Paul Secunda outlined in his article, the interests of the state are merely interests and not rights. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Member of the Opposition. Uh, we now move to the closing statements of both uh, sides of this uh, debate. Uh, beginning um, as we have with the government side. Um, can the government whip please address us on why uh, her team has uh, won this debate? Madam Speaker, opposition has tried to make this debate about discrimination of the black race, whilst all the government has tried to do is eliminate the abuse and unreliability of the law, the likely hindrance of ability to carry out tasks such as saving lives by the police force. The law is a living instrument ever ready for evolution, but must strike a balance to deal with law that civilians, employers can rely on for certainty, practicality, and rationality. So the generous approach that opposition relies on, as it is by Home Affairs and Fisher, says that it does not allow for the coverage of locks and braids unless it has more, whether it be political, social, or religious injustice reasons. So such laws, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience cannot be taken for granted. Freedom of conscience, not practice, not lead this only an inward desire, not catered to by this right. As my Prime Minister rightly said in summary, to freely allow all expression within a society of differing opinions and beliefs are bound to clash at some point. Where one might, inf where I might infringe someone else's right or another person might infringe another person's right. And would be open I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Madam Whip. Um, the, the argument that you're offering now is it a sort of variant of the floodgates argument? Uh, yes. In that, I see. As it regards I, to the opening, as it regards to opening Pandora's box, yes, because it's not a free for all. If I may continue, but, it, but uh, hang on a second. But um, should should we really take into account a floodgates argument? 
doesn't the, the Oaks test allow us um, at each instance or, or with each item uh, to, to consider whether the limitation is justifiable or not? Um, so, so in other words, I'm questioning the relevance uh, of the floodgates argument, uh, since but, Oaks will allow us to, to assess each. Well, I'll be coming that, to that shortly in my speech, uh, Madam Moderator, if you'll allow me. So as I, I continue to say, um, for which the opposition is clearly fine with opening who has in the security of their exclusive safe house, may I remind them that no man is above the law. It would be an irresponsible act of government to not place limitations on this right. As a member of government rightly spoke on, freedom of expression without more is, is, a, mere, is a mere aesthetic desire and an aesthetic other than which allows for the proper carrying out of tasks and leaves no room for hindrance, has no place within the police force, which is critical to national security. This is not Instagram. Inhumane treatment or opposition calls for. Gone are the days we feared for being enlisted without or will or, or against our own will. As such, now we face a privilege to choose to join the police force. Years upon years of publicized rules and regulations made privy to potential applicants knowing exactly what they were signing up for. A danger ridden position held to the highest standard of yes, discipline. Yes, but, but, but Madam Whip, if, if, you're, if your own entity had the rule, didn't enforce it, allowed her to enter with that hairstyle, doesn't that suggest that you didn't regard it as being particularly important? Well, that's not entirely true, as opposition had actually stated that same point, you know. It would actually be a discrimination to not allow her to join the force because of her locks, right? So having guaranteed that she would have been aware of the possibility of having to cut her locks, I'm pretty sure they would have given her that ample time upon joining to decide whether or not what, what, is, the, what is the choice she would do with her locks, not eliminating her completely from joining the, the, the force itself, right? So... At what point did it become inhumane for you to have the ability to choose? Civil servants have by choice given themselves to the service of protecting, being heavily relied upon for national safety, and this naturally puts them in a different category of rules to which they must abide. The sorry, opposition sorry, person sorry, one, one more question for you. Um, no problem. Madam. Um, doesn't the defrater's case say to us that civil servants' um, rights can't just be... Um, you know, subject to a blanket restriction, um, that uh, there must be differentiation according to their rules. So in other words, there is, there is acceptance that, you know, uh, there may be the need for restrictions in order to um, allow them to properly carry out their functions. But um, doesn't the Freitas tell us that we shouldn't have blanket restrictions? I agree yeah. with that statement. I agree with that statement, which is why the TPC allows for the Minister of, of Security and the, the Commission of Police to have the discretion to decide what exactly is, is a, a hindrance upon, upon their roles, what exactly it is that, with, with, with the limitation Oaks test has seen, whether or not it is necessary to even infringe upon their rights in the first place. Right. So given that the law gives these persons the necessary authority to decide whether or not um, and have the discretion, I think it is a joint to the specific role of, of what exactly is necessary for that person to ensure that they carry out their role properly. If I answer that question, uh, it is it is only natural that the social and cultural background of this country be considered in the formulation of this dress code policy. The likely hairstyle of potential. Uh, Madam, Madam, with your time is up, can you just. Just give us a nutshell of this point that you're about to make. In a I sentence. Was... One sentence. <laughs> I, I simply say that the in record of the formulation of the rules that were, were accorded to the TC the P, TPC, uh, it it whew, according to the rules of the TPC, it includes for the insurity of of locks in the case that it, it has a actual reason an actual rationality behind it and not just for the main aesthetics of it for the government has its place to ensure the safety of our police officers okay thank you so long sentence but we accept it as a <laughs> sentence uh, so close off the debate we will hear from the opposition uh, uh whip um the floor is yours good morning everyone as sad government tried to make their case, I will try to let you understand as the reasons why sad opposition would have brought home this debate. 
Many things were said, and I'm going to try to be very succinct and let you understand the fallacies on sad government and how it is that said opposition actually corrected them. Now, sad opposition, opposition members started out by saying that civil servants are at a higher threshold. They are more susceptible to restrictions given their status. But guess what? Erwin Toy came back and combated that statement by saying citizens of the state are nonetheless also citizens which means by extent their freedoms their liberties must also be protected and must not be shouted and treated with scant regard in addition to the fact on danger and security that locks make one more susceptible to danger by the aggressors long here in and of itself by anyone regardless of it being locked would have still made anyone more susceptible if it is drawn or pulled so side government really made an argument that we find was completely fallacious in addition to the fact the the reality is that employing an inherently discriminatory and unfair policy equally will never make it not fair and non-discriminatory. And even though Ava is the one who is being discriminated against, what we fail to understand is that subliminally, as my op op deputy opposition leader would have said, that Ava represents not just herself, but the single entity of every other person who would be at the whims and mercies of state government. This policy in and of itself is discriminatory indirectly. And what it does is tighten the sinews of a marginalized, oppressive system and and historical background that Afro-Caribbean persons and the Caribbean has faced uh, time Madam and time Whip. again. Yes. Madam Whip, um, well, certainly I think, I think we would all agree that there was a time when um, persons who wear locks um, would be, um, you know, readily, openly discriminated against, um, suffer lots of oppression and marginalization. Um, but um, uh, hasn't, hasn't the society shifted? Um, aren't um, persons now able to, to, to readily uh, wear locks? Um, additionally, didn't we see um, the, the Prime Minister for Jamaica um, some time ago um, apologizing for um, the, um, the, treatment. The, the treatment of, of Rastafari in Jamaica? Isn't that evidence that in, in the Anglophone Caribbean, um, the treatment of Rastafari um, has improved significantly, um, improved such that discrimination may no longer be a significant issue. Improved significantly, but not enough. And there's still so much more to go. In fact, if it did improve significantly, such a policy would not have even been implemented. And for us to have this whole per se prescription that persons who would done their luck should be would be affected. What we don't realize is that Ava is inherently in and of herself has her human dignity eroded. What we don't understand is that she has been this there are disadvantages that face. She is more susceptible to the disciplinary hearing, the embarrassment, and the loss of her job. And then to come again with the the Prime Minister opening that if one cannot communicate, it, it cannot be protected. And if the conscience is not known, then it does not fall prey to discrimination. It's actually fallacious and it's very flawed. The mere fact that she's done in her hairstyle, she's expressing it, she's communicating it. And as our judges had rightly said, it is one of her political statements, which is also has been communicated. And as such, because Ava is definitely being zoned in on, she's been, pardon me, she's been treated disadvantageously and differently from the others. In addition, sad, the sad deputy prime minister made the point or the assertion rather that once the hairstyle or culture has been appropriated, then apparently it loses its roots and origins from the culture that it had before. And what if, that does not make any sense because really and truly it doesn't mean, not because another race is done in the hairstyle doesn't mean that it's still inherent and protected by the persons who still believe it is their own in addition to make it short and spicy this policy simply in and of itself though we can understand safety and security are good merits you can't single out individuals and expect that oh when you do this is, then persons are going to be affected. Ava dons her hairstyle every day. It is a representation and a badge of cultural beauty and who she is as a person. And singling her out and making her more susceptible to unemployment and disgrace is no way to go. And in this day and age of where we are moving to a more cultural, open and accepted society, it still does not make any sense. All we are doing is tightening the signs of discrimination and pushing further to a more marginalized society that we have been trying eons and eons to get away from. I thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam uh, Opposition Whip. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to an end of uh, the debate itself. 
uh, my sister judge and I will now uh, retire to uh, deliberate. Um, in the meantime, uh, we add back to Dion Jackson Miller, uh, who will lead the discussion segment of the proceedings. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Jeffrey. So we have, we've been allocated 15 minutes for this segment of the program. And let me just say, just before we go into the discussion, my own congratulations to all the participants. We can hear the research and the work and the preparation that went into that, complemented by the energy and passion you all brought to the presentation, made for a really, really engaging debate. So um, really congrats. Also the fact we got through a whole Zoom session with no babies crying or dogs barking. So that puts us way ahead of a lot of the, a lot of the Zoom sessions I've been in. All right. So we're going to start off with Carol Narcisse and Clyde Williams for their comments. And then we, as I said, it's a discussion. So I just want people to jump in. Well, jump in via indicating using the real raised um, hand feature so we can do it in an orderly manner but we do want to hear from as many people as possible gonna start with carol and lest i be accused of gender discrimination i'm going alphabetically based on last name so, <laughs> so carol do kick us off with your thoughts yeah yeah boy you know a very robust and 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 as you said well researched on both sides um, uh, discussion. I, I think in, in a discussion like this, of course, one, ha one, is, one is seized with thoughts about the fact that rules are not disconnected. Rules are not made in a vacuum. They're not made in isolation. They have historical antecedents and cultural antecedents. Um, and so the, 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 the government side would have, I think, the harder role to hold um, to, to demonstrate that, that such a rule is not, isn't, isn't a ha is, doesn't have a hazard of being uh, discriminatory against black people. Um, uh, I, I, I think they did a, a valiant job in trying to, to suggest that meaning, meaning is a, 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 a expression and meaning are, are, are things that are not contained in, in here. Um, uh, of course, many would argue that that, that that can hardly be sustained when you look at, at other groups, other ethnic groups, um, particular hairstyles. If you take Hasidic Jews, for example, right? The, the, the hairstyle of a Hasidic Jew has a, has a meaning. Um, uh, so, so issues like these are issues, and, and just arguing on, the, on points of law, um, always bring up for me the, the, the issue of how law is not um, independent of culture, how law is not unaffected by, by, by historical and cultural contexts, um, and how those then have to have to inform our interpretations of, of, of the law. I, I, I happen to to be partial to the opposition's um, side in the debate <laughs> for obvious reasons. But, um, but, but I think that the government side um, made a valiant attempt. Co continue, Carol, till, she come, till Dan comes back in. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's that it's that um, problem of the Zoom era for getting to unmute. So, <laughs> so your time, Clyde. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit more about debating itself and the structure. So I, I didn't find that the Prime Minister laid out the case of the government in a sufficiently clear manner that coming, as Carol said, with in context, a harder case to carry. So I, I thought the Prime Minister ought to have spent a little bit more time in, in setting out the definitions, the meanings to be given to expression, uh, for instance, which have become central in the debate, and why it should be contained and why the expected definition of the other side should not be accepted. So, so uh, 
And I think part of the challenge the Prime Minister, all the debaters had, in my opinion, is that they tried to communicate too much content. In seven minutes, you can't possibly communicate so much content in seven minutes uh, for the hearers to digest it properly, especially on complex, profound issues of rights, expression, conscience, equality before the law. They're, they're just already complex and heavy issues uh, filled with subjective positions. So I would have much preferred for the prime minister, the, the government to have selected the core points and argue around those core points rather than trying to, to argue so many points. Uh, and that's for all the, the debaters. Uh, and, and again, the reading was just too much for me. I, I'll tell you, a debate is not about reading, guys. And, and part yes, of the reading yes, is because you have so much information to communicate. Once you have to read, you realize you're having too much information to communicate. So I would say, call it. Zoom in on the three critical things as the, after the PM defines uh, the case. Make, you should make two or three critical points of analysis and yield. Uh, also, I want to speak about structure in, in, in the presentation. Persuasion is about reminding us at the end what you just said. So if you're arguing a case, in this case you're debating, when you're finished, you have to sum it up for us. It's just, that's what it is. You have to remind us of why, of what you just said. So in the end, the prime minister should have said, the case of the government is one, two, three, boom, done, or whatever, but, but sum it up. And again, I found all the debaters to have been a little bit weak in terms of structure. There was no clear introduction, no clear body, and no clear conclusion of your arguments. That's very critical if you want somebody to vote for you in a debate. Um, the, a couple of other quick things. The whips were allowed to, in my opinion, the, the, the government will introduce a new argument. I hadn't heard it before, probably slipped by a little quickly. But the floodgates argument was a new argument. I didn't hear it before. You're not allowed as the whip to introduce a new argument at the stage of the debate. Your job is to tie up all the arguments made by the government and advanced in the debate and drive home why you must get the vote. You can't introduce a new whole argument at the end. It's not permissible as the whip in the debate. You've seen everything. You must come and conclude it not get into a new argument. New examples are allowed, but new, no new argument. Uh, and the, uh, I found it a little odd, odd that the structure of the debate gave the last word to the opposition. I have a challenge. That structurally is that the debate must be closed by the government. So when they, that's my view on, the, on a debate. The government brings the motion, and the government must have the last word on the motion, closing the debate. So the opposition whip should have come immediately after the last opposition speaker to close their side, and then the government wraps the debate. But that is a matter for the Modus Law Society to determine how best to proceed with that. So in wrap, I found the content too heavy, too much content to be communicated in a few minutes. Uh, and that's always going to be challenging. You know, the, the research says people forget most of what they hear. <laughs> and if you try to communicate a lot, it's going to get worse, even though we're a lawyer sitting and listening. Uh, uh, two, I found that the analysis and arguments were so quick. They were like, ooh, ooh. just slow it down, drive on the critical points, make the analysis, and then move on. And I also found that a little bit more organization could have gone into the debate. And my final point is, when you're debating, you don't need to speak about any protocols. You just get up when you're calling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I continue the case of the government side. And I wish to present da 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 Those are my comments. I thought I'd emphasize more on the debating aspects and the structural aspects of debating and, and allow Carol to speak to the more content as she did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Th thanks, Clyde. Important <laughs> points. Let, there was one thing perhaps I'd add, and I don't know if either you or anybody else wants to comment on as well. In a debate and also in courts, you have to take your guide from the people on the bench or the people oh, in the judges. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. so I, I suspect right. Clyde knows where I'm going. So let me just say it and then I'll let him and anybody else jump in. No, what happens is that in a, in a court case as well as in a debate, 
hopefully many times almost always the the people leading the judges or the ju- the judges in either case are seized of the various issues they perhaps even understand where you're going in some of their arguments so when they ask a question it's something that you have not yet made clear that they think is important to the gravamen of the debate and that you have to zero in on an answer immediately. You can't brush it off and say, all right, me come back to that or, you know, and I'll deal with that later. Take your guide from them and realize that that is an important issue and how you respond may very well determine the, the outcome. So a hundred percent agreement. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Let me let like, I respond. I want, I, well, Clyde, you just finish the point and then... 100% in agreement with that. In in fact, you can win the case by answering the question in a manner that leaves the judge so persuaded that's at the end of it. Uh, uh, But but I also quickly want to say something about the judges. The the, the interventions by the judges should should not be longer than 20 seconds and they shouldn't have two quick interventions. In other words, if a judge asks a question, it should be answered by the debater. The other judge must yield and then probably bring your question at some other point that you thought about, or a follow-up question. But, but the judges ate up some of the time by asking back-to-back questions, both judges, uh, and so on. But yes, Dion, you have to address the point head-on. So as a debater, what you must do is simply, or, or a judge, or a, a lawyer for the judge, you must say, um, uh, that is a question that has concerned us considerably. And answer it. <laughs> but just, but just answer yeah. it. I, I, I want to say that in a way, it, 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 as an educator now, right, in our system, one of the concerns that I've always had about education is how how it has in in the Caribbean context, because we're modeling a particular approach to education, it has become about regurgitation as opposed to internalization. Um, And so so you have a set of points, um, you've researched them, et cetera, and you're very committed to, to, to staying within the confines of what you have researched and put down. But you may not necessarily have internalized a deep uh, understanding and appreciation of the essence of your point, such that if somebody throws you a question or throws um, something at you, you are able to, you're able to, respond in a way that doesn't make you feel as if you're about to, to lose it, right? You, 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 know, stick to your notes. you know, stick to your notes, you're going to lose it. Um, and that's a function of confidence, um, raising people's confidence in their understanding of issues um, and their ability to understand the essence of a point it, and, and why that point um, is crucial, has, has resonance, um, uh, et cetera. So, so we, 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 you know, there's a sense of, in which sometimes we, we, we structure things so tightly that we are afraid to stray from the structure or the notes um, because we're not so confident. I'm so sorry, Clyde. Hold on. I just sorry. want to bring sorry. in Glenn Roy, who has his hand up. Glenn Roy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit of context um, to the conversation uh, because I feel, I mean, very valid points have been made, but I, but I mean, I know I, uh, because I've been behind the scenes, I kind of understand some of what the other influences were. So there were times when questions were being asked and, I, and in my view, the adequate answer would have gone into, um, I guess, another aspect of the debate. And since all of the debaters, they're a team sharing space with very particular sub motions that they, were, they wanted to address and that they were required to address. In some of the questions, there was, a, I think, a, a reasonable tentativeness not to go too far um, in answering certain direct questions. Um, and so I think we should also be you know, mindful in the conversation about the, the, the readiness to directly respond to questions raised by judges um, in the normal context of, uh, uh, of, a, of a court case vis-a-vis 
um, a team-based um, discussion with, very specific, with each person having specific remits. Um, so that would be my intervention there. But I, but I, um, I really wanted to celebrate the fact that the debaters were able to have conversations about four, four very distinct rights in a way where you're going to debate. Um, a lot of us who do public law and, and teach it with preconceived, you, you have an answer already. Um, and that they were able to kind of disturb the waters and make us think, well, maybe my answer is not that clear. Um, and that let me rethink what I feel about expression. Must it include all forms of aesthetic expression? Um, and I think it's something for us to think about um, um, even broader, because I don't think even within our jurisprudence locally, we, we've tasked ourselves with that point, which is, probably, which is the big issue that I think, or one of the big issues that comes out of um, the Kensington case, that we haven't dealt with expression um, in this way, outside of the concerns regarding the media and freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It, um, and, and conveying political meaning and, 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 and religious meaning. And I think that's something that now we have to really think about more. Let, let, me, let me just a, a reply to, to Glenroy, if I may. You know, lawyers are people who reply. All right, here is what, Glenroy. I accept the point about the discrete submotions. I think we all accept that because I, I kept looking back at the submotion that has been debated within the, the bigger motion. However, in a debate, the, res, the debater must reply, respond to the question asked. There are no two ways about it. You, you, you reply, and if it's going into another area, what you do at that stage is just to simply indicate that the whip will tie it up at the end. Will we'll elaborate. Yes. Yes, but you must respond. So you may wish to say, that particular question takes us into the area of expression. This particular sub-mode relates to conscience. But let me quickly just make a few remarks, and the whip will expand on those at the end of the debate. But you must. So even if it is only to segue to say, why, I mean, I have time for you to really answer the question because I didn't know another sub-motion. But quickly, this is the position, and let me continue on my point. So, so your point is taken, but you must in the debate deal with what the judge has put on the table, because as Diane had, had said earlier. Uh, not to do that means that he looks. I want to quickly say something too about the prime minister. He buckled in his first, he backtracked early. There was something about trying to make, uh, question about, he said something about expression simplicity. And the statement he made about expression simplicity seized upon by a judge, asked him, and he boxed up a little bit in terms of what he meant by that, because it seemed as if he had made a concession within the first four minutes of the debate itself. The judge did ask him, is that a concession that you have made, sir? And he sorted himself out of the end. Yes, thank you yeah, so much. There, there was also a concession made with respect to um, uh, the blanket nature of, of the rule, um, versus uh, an acknowledgement that people can serve in different capacities in the force. <laughs> and in yes. some of those capacities, it does no, no risk to the, 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 the argument that says, if you have locks, you can be disarmed easily, your hair can be held on to, etc. There was a concession made there, there as well. I, I also think that the, 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 on the opposition side, the issue of is there is the rule a rule about long hair in which case long hair on the heads of people of varying ethnicities um whether whether the rule is applicable to people of different ethnicities who may have long hair and if you take the argument about being able to hold on to the hair and disarm, um, or, or is it limited to a particular kind of long hair um, that has a particular set of, of characteristics to it? And in which case, why that long hair and not the long hair of a Caucasian member of the force or an Asian member of the force? Um, etc. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know, Clyde, if you caught if, if they if they made that kind of of, 
of argument any at all. Uh, just, just before just before Clyde comes in, see our judge discriminatory the discriminatory point. Just before Clyde comes in, I see our judges have returned. Now we're, we're, we've okay. done the 15 minutes of discussion, but we're actually doing very well on time because we're scheduled to finish 11.45. I see Jeffrey smiling. So with the judge's okay. permission, I think we can go another five minute discussion. Is that right, Jeffrey? Give me a mm -hmm. thumbs up. That's okay. Because we're just about at 11.32 now. So I, I just want to let the two commentators finish and then I'd love to hear a word from the Prime Minister and the opposition leader a little bit in terms of just, just what the process was like for them. But Carol? Uh, Carol, I suggest, I suggest um, before um, uh, Mr. Williams continues, what I'd suggest, ma um, Madam Moderator, um, so looking at the, the um, comments on YouTube and so on, um, it, it's clear that our audience has an interest in um, in hearing more about the um, the substance, you know, social commentary and so on on on, on these issues. Um, so perhaps um, the, the the commentators could um, offer um, you know comments from that um, perspective. Great, thank you so much. But you're okay with us going a little longer. Yes. Okay, great. All right, Clyde, uh, let let me let you yeah. go in. Okay, I, I, have, I, I have refrained, I have not really gone into the substance of it because I, I have views that it will take a little while to explore them here. And, and it's just, but, but I'm not supportive of any kind of expression that can limit someone having to prove that the particular expression is locked into some specific belief or the conveying of a specific idea. Uh, that is not my position. Um, I may not necessarily have a whole heap of Caribbean Jews students to support that. Uh, there's a decision out of the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice that, uh, that, that I would lean on heavily in terms of, and it was mentioned by the team, that would be the opposition team. So, so, so my view is that, that freedom of expression should not be limited to just somebody wishing to convey an idea or a belief. Uh, so for instance, I had, when I left school, I used to push back my hair like Walter Rodney. Um, I wasn't conveying any, any specific- In the long old days when you did that. You know, yeah, I wasn't, but, but insofar as an expression of Clyde Williams, at that time in my own development as a black lawyer in the country, that's how I wanted to look. And I wasn't trying to say this is my belief or this is, and, and I do believe that if, if freedom of expression is, is not defined to embrace how an emotional, um, how emotional and feelings, that's the word I want to get, emotions and feelings in that when I step out of my ear, push back, so and I've got you and I feel good about myself as this thing from cutting it bald. So, so, so my thing really would require probably going to the highest court in terms of exploring freedom of expression because we also have freedom of, of conscience and also have the right to freedom of political opinions. So, so the freedom of expression for me is going to be beyond the hard concrete things of belief and ideas to more aesthetic uh, things of how I feel about this and so forth and so on. Okay, let me ask the um, Prime Minister and then opposition leader. I see a question here from Nito. Does her engagement with the locks known to her supervisors call us have a legitimate expectation she would be able to serve with locks? And I know there was a conversation through, at, towards the end in relation to the she knew the rules. So let me ask each of you, um, Mr. Prime Minister. Okay, hi. Am I responding in my capacity no, man, the debate, the debate done. The All right, done. I can answer personally. <laughs> um, great. Um, so I don't necessarily, I kind of, okay, so let me start over. So yeah, I do agree that there perhaps is a legitimate expectation that if you knew the rules at the beginning, that if you're going to enter the force with your locks, then there's an expectation that you might be restricted in how long it can be um, or having it at all. But also I felt like it was a, it, the, the police force fell down in it, in, in, it, it, 
in its own enforcement if we're going to have a rule and allow people to enter and then after the facts uh, seek to to restrict them then that is a little bit unfair let her know from the get-go that you are wearing locks the policy does not support it for x reason and it's not discriminatory i would think because we are applying this to everybody for the greater safety of whatever purpose you're trying to serve and in that context you're just not a suitable candidate similar to other jurisdictions which may have weight or height requirement um if they tell you that you're too short or you are too fat or too slim in some instances then that's just the the way that you go about navigating that particular space opposition leader thoughts on that right. the work you've done <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I do agree with uh, Mr. Prime Minister because it seemed from the intention of the police force that their policy was a bit relaxed because even though she ought to be aware of the policy um, upon applying for the job, though it should have been enforced at the beginning or she should have been told from the get-go that, hey, there's a policy and if you're going to work for us, so you need to get in line, X, Y, Z. But my thing is, if you're going to enforce a policy, there can't be any ambiguity in it, right? Um, for example, the argument about... So the argument is that there's a concern for uniformity and safety, mainly because of the length, right? So if, it's, if the policy is in regards to the length, it's not necessarily about the hairstyle, and that's what Ms. Carroll was saying. So it should not necessarily be about the hairstyle itself, but the length of the hairstyle that's worn by various persons of different ethnicities. So that's my two cents. Okay, I know, I know we have students who are of higher hair groups who have done hair groups, <laughs> not hair, <laughs> who have done, some, yes, Gabriel, yes, you can see what's in my mind here, who have done some of the more advanced courses as well, the human rights course, admin law and whatever. So let me ask um, any of the, the year three students perhaps who, who might want to comment on, on that, anybody? Or in the meantime, Clyde, you want you have a thought on that? Legitimate expectation thought? Issue? You're muted, you're muted, you're muted. I'm sorry, very sorry about that. I would have gone in there strong if I were a lawyer for that lady because I would be riding heavy on that initial point. You saw me in my locks and you, you said some things, but conduct more important than just words alone. So I would have gone in heavy on a legitimate expectation that if I present with luck and you accept me with my luck, then, you know, so I would have gone in heavy on that. I, I, must, I, I must agree with, with, not must, so Carl had mentioned something earlier about internalizing your position. So this is not just for debates, this is for life you have to clarify your positions internally. Um, and, and this is not a simple issue, this freedom of expression on whether I, if I want to ball off my, my hair and the police force say I can't ball off the side of my hair and join the police force. So those, are, those are not sim simple issues because on the other side, the questions of the, ob the objective being sought to be met by the authorities. And so on, in this case, a standardization of, of uniform and uniformity of discipline in the ranks, looking alike, and so forth and so on. So, so one has to first debate things internally, clarify them before you can actually present and answer questions on the fly in public. Okay, final comment hey, from Emmy, Carol, then the, we go to the judges. One of the challenges, one of, one of the challenges that, that, that I see is it is the, the, the free for all um, argument and the notion that can, in fact, is it justifiable? Is it outrageous to say that there are some contexts where, um, it's, whether it's the army or, or the police force or, or, or whatever, where a certain degree of um, uh, uniformity um, a certain a degree of limitation on individuality um, is is necessary. That that the overarching nature of the entity is one that requires 
conforming, following orders, that, that if you fail to do that, it can cost you your life. Right? In this kind, in this particular kind of entity. And so in that particular kind of entity, we're not following rules, not following order can get you killed. Is it can we foresee uh, can we envision it being justified uh, to say that we have to begin to train you up in that discipline of confining yourself um to to uh, 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 to the whole rather than to just what your individual desire or, or expression or beliefs may may be. I, I, I think that 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 um that tension is is a real tension um and one not to be to, to be made light of. All right, I'm gonna go to the judges now. I tell you I can't get through a Zoom session without a dog marking in the background. <laughs> <laughs> is that your background? <laughs> It's a rule. It's a rule. All right, let me go to Gabriel Elliott Williams, first and most best speaker and winner. Um, thank, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. So uh, before um, um, I announce the, the best speaker and the, the winning team, so just to, to, to thank the uh, commentators um, for, for their comments um, and to say um, that I'm sure... Uh, from the student's perspective, you know, they're, they're well taken. Um, you know, you've offered, um, you know, um, examples of or, or areas in which um, they, they can look to, to improve. Um, just to say, students, um, myself and, and Mr. Foreman, so, so, so setting aside the uh, judge's hat um, and putting on um, teacher hat, um, so both Mr. Foreman and, and I teach on the Commonwealth Caribbean Human Rights course, and I'm super proud of you, massively, massively uh, proud of you. Um, you. You took on this task, uh, you know, just uh, maybe two, two weeks three ago. weeks ago, uh, and you were able to um, research learn and, and, um, and learn new substantive areas of law um, and then um, fashion your submissions yourself. Um, I, I am amazed. I am amazed. Um, you know, for, for the benefit of our, our um, viewing audience, um, you just listen to submissions from um, persons who haven't even studied, um, some of them haven't even studied um, Commonwealth Caribbean human rights law formally yet. Um, and even for those who have studied it, uh, there were new substantive areas of law um, here that the students had to, to, um, uh, to research, learn, um, and then formulate submissions. And so um, big up yourself, massively, massively proud of you. Yeah? All right. Um, so now down to, um, to the results. Um, you know, so we, we thought that, that it, was, it, was, um, it was pretty tight. Um, uh, we, um, you know, went back and forth, um, discussed, and came to the view that the, um, the is best speaker first, or is it um, go best speaker first, or best team, or better team? Speaker. All right. All right, so in terms of the, the best speaker, um, uh, so we thought that there were a number of you who, um, who could lay claim to, to this prize. Um, but in the end, we made the determination um, that Shannon Young was the best speaker. All right, um, and so now um, for the, um, the winning team, um, this we thought was was um was pretty close in fact um the um we went back and forth on this um and in the end um what tipped the scales was um you know the the team that had the um the best speaker so the winning team um is um the opposition side Uh, thank you, Ms. Elliot Williams. 
Um, before I hand over to Ms. Jackson um, uh, Miller, um, I just want to uh, just list out and itemize the various uh, persons to whom um, thanks are, are well deserved. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to the uh, students um, who are at the heart and centerpiece of what we uh, do here at the, the Faculty of, of Law. As uh, my uh, co-judge has, has explained, um, much work was done over the past I mean, two to, to three weeks in immersing yourselves in the, uh, the detail of uh, this area of law. Um, special uh, thanks in this regard as well to um, Janelle Small, who was the debate master who helped us to organize the, uh, uh, the, the, the students, and, and to Joanne, uh, who took some time out from um, his own particular studies uh, to uh, give us some insight into the, this area of law generally. Um, huge thanks to our guests, guest commentators, Ms. Carol Narcisse and uh, Mr. Clyde uh, uh, Williams for their perspectives on the, on the debate and um, in relation to the issues as, as well. Uh, to uh, Mona Media, uh, uh, Ishmael uh, particular, uh, who facilitated all of the technology. The, the presentation um, has been quite, quite excellent, I, I, I think. Uh, we were given much advice um, in relation to how best to uh, uh, present and to, to frame the various aspects of the debate. Uh, so we are internally grateful uh, to, to Mona Media for its assistance and to Ishmael in particular. Um, huge thanks as well to um, uh, Mr. A Andrew Hutchinson and Ms. Marjorie uh, Henry, uh, both of whom uh, work with us here at the, the, the faculty. Um, they each uh, facilitated our work in, in a number of, of ways. And uh, to the coaches, uh, Ms. Gray and uh, Mr. Uh, Mori, uh, for also being ready to, to assist the teams when, when needed. Uh, thank you as well, Ms. Dean Jackson Miller, for becoming uh, uh, available. You've done an excellent job um, guiding us through, through the day. Um, special thanks to um, Ms. Tracy Robinson and Ms. Uh, Ramona Beholar, who conducted teaching sessions uh, for the students um, in advance of this debate. Um, and a special, special thanks to my uh, co-judge um, for um, a lot of the work that, that was, that was uh, put in. Um, I, I've said to her off air that I'm, I'm more, I was more her junior um, in this process than, than a true co-organizer. -or -or um, both herself and uh, Tracy Robinson um, is, led and did most of the heavy lifting in relation to, to, to this um, um, event. Uh, so thanks to, to all of you, and I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks to the viewing audience for participating as well. I now hand over to Dion Jackson Miller. Okay, well, I would only add to that uh, my own congratulations to the students, all of the students. As I said, it was an engaging debate, and I'm seeing the comments on YouTube. People are certainly appreciating it. I think it's summed up by Keith Yan, who is asking, when is the next one? <laughs> <laughs> Dion, oh. Dion, Dion, the winner, which position did the winner speak from? I just have them as deputy and prime minister. I don't know the name of the position. I want to know who is the best debater. I can't put a... Gabrielle. Yes. She's what position on the team? Deputy or what? Hold on. Gabrielle will tell us in a minute. I'm sorry. The, the, that's the deputy prime minister. Okay. So the deputy prime minister is the best debater. No, sorry. Deputy, deputty deputy leader of the opposition. Oh. Okay. Deputy cool. 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 Opposition. Okay. Solid. All right. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, and again, thanks to thanks to both of the judges as well as Tracy Robinson. An indication of, as I said, the, the just very dynamic and exciting environment that it is to learn law here at Mona Law. Thank hey, you hey. all so much for watching, and come back next time. Right, next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. And of course, remember, there is a case related to this that we are watching in the region coming out of Belize. So it will be interesting to see the result there. And part of what has happened here is the regional contextualization of an important issue that's also affecting us in Jamaica. So good day and keep safe, everybody.